Hi, Charles. All right. So, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, Dakota, do you want to tell us a little bit about what brings you kind of maybe like a one minute, just anything you feel inspired to share with us? Really don't have anything. <laughs> I gotta be more specific. <laughs> how about how about just briefly? What what uh? Tell us a little bit about just your interest in in integral theory. Oh uh. I notice these patterns. I've been trying to track for most of my life and figure out how people tick. And then I googled some of my observations enough times that. Uh, Ken Wilber stuff came up and integral life stuff came up so and it was like yay there's I mean for a while it was like why isn't there a community and then they introduced mm -hmm. the forum last year and it was like yay finally awesome thank you yeah I think a lot of us feel the same way and uh, and Coda and I have been having a very fruitful uh, uh, correspondence on the forum so I'm really happy to see you in person and uh, happy to join us today so I wanted to go over a few things, uh, little crossfire amendments or changes that I wanted to uh, discuss here. Um, so the first thing was I kind of wanted to make this a little bit more provocative and heated <laughs> and, and have topics that were there's a little bit more at stake since this, I, I kind of wanted to bring some of that fire back into it or just inject some into it a little bit more. So I may be, you may see a slight stylistic change as the moderator um, that I might uh, implement. And I also want to, us to focus kind of on specific cultural controversial issues. And, and some of us have been having a very rich discussion on the um, Discord server about some of these issues. So I thought we'd kind of bring that into crossfire and get, and part of my intention for this is a way to practice bringing our integral consciousness or, or awareness to inform these very divisive issues that I think are causing a lot of problems, you know, division and, and fracturing in society. So this is kind of a good spiritual practice to, to hold this with equanimity and, and in a larger integral embrace. And also it's recorded, so hopefully this will have a, a good impact, you know, on whoever watches this as kind of, as, as, uh, as us kind of being thought leaders and shaping and framing the conversation around such divisive issues. So we, I have a whole litany of them um, we're going to go through today and I kind of figured we could start with one and if it, it completely runs out of juice after 20 minutes, half an hour, and everyone feels content and we're all settled on a pretty integrated position, we can just go on to the next one. Um, or if, but if not, we can just spend an hour and a half talking about one. So, it, you know, we, we have some uh, flexibility here. I thought I'd um, keep it to, we'll, we'll, we'll do around two and a half minutes to share. Uh, and Heidi, since you've been, uh, gone uh, i'll just tell you that we haven't been doing strict timekeeping since we've had kind of small groups uh the past few times so I'll, I'll kind of if someone's rambling i'll kind of tell you to generally wind it down but i won't be too uh, uh strict with that and also um yeah so i think that's it so we'll just go around do a little intro and just one minute about how you're doing and um today the the fun icebreaker question is if you could have lunch with anyone throughout history or anyone, you know, of all in anyone that you wanted to, who would it be? So I'll just say for myself, uh, I'm really excited about this today. And if I could have lunch with anyone, it would definitely be the Buddha. Go ahead, anyone. I can come in. I really missed you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but I had enough people to talk to talk with and very interesting topics. So if I could have lunch with I think I would call you. I would like to to talk with him and get more of his experiences of these other worlds he has of, of the archetypes. Uh you know, I would, would like that. Yeah, and I'm back for three days. As I said, I finally sleep and uh try to integrate a little bit what I have lived in these two weeks, which was in many ways unexpected. And I have 
got also a different um, approach to integral, to see integral in a different way. Much more, how can I say, embodied is a strange word, but more, less theoretical. Uh, so, so, so much more life um, informed. So we might have occasion to talk about that. And yeah, I really appreciate uh, all the levels of development now in a different way than I did before when they were just, um, uh, how do you say, uh, hierarchical elements of something. And so, so yeah, m more uh, uh, an image than, than real experience. So. Yeah, so far. Go ahead, Charles. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I can't stay with you too long today. I've mean, got too much going on, but I did want to drop in and, and say hello and, and tell you who I'd like to have lunch with. That, that would be Ken Wilbur. And what I'd ask him about is something I've been thinking about recently. Uh, you know, he... He thinks about the quadrants often and, and writes and talks about them in terms of uh, beauty, truth, and goodness. And for a while now, I thought there's something uh, very inspiring about that, but also uh, uh, somewhat unbalanced. Uh, let me explain what I mean. Uh, we know that every concept generates its opposite. So black, non-black, just, unjust, uh, and so male, female, although that's a, little, that's a little murky these days. But you got my point. Okay, so beauty, goodness, and truth generate their opposites also. So ugliness, so let me put it this way. The good, the true, the beautiful. The bad, the false, the ugly. I call those the, the shadow material of the four quadrants. So if I had Ken for lunch today, I'd say, Ken, aren't you being a little cloyingly uh, positive about your four quadrants? What about the dark side? Of course, I know you talk about the personal shadow, but uh, you don't dwell on it, and I don't blame you. But what about the dark side of human existence? That seems to <clears throat> that seems to accompany the evolutionary uh, the evolution of spirit at every stage, and uh, it seems to me we should talk about it a little more often and and what it means and, and how we're to deal with it. So I'm going to put together a four quadrant diagram showing uh, beauty, of course, in the upper left, uh, which is the domain of art, but put a line under it uh, and put the ugly underneath. And then the little lower left, there'll be the good and the bad. And in the upper right, there'll be the true and the false. And that will cover actually both those right-hand quadrants. So uh, there's my mischievous contribution for today. And uh, as I say, I'm going to have to check out in a few minutes. So good to see you all. Thanks for listening to my, uh, to my piece. I hope you have fun today. Wow. Okay, Charles, uh, please draw it up. Please make sure I see it. I will definitely want to chew into that with you. Had an experience in the wake of a meditation retreat once that uh, I would love to throw into that mix. And Heidi, at some point, I really would love to hear in depth, more in depth about your experience at the at uh, your series of meetings. And that brings me to kind of the point, Ryan, I think Ryan was making and some of us, the I'm starting to ask myself the question as a, as a thought experiment, what if the embodiedness, the living juiciness of this is our move collectively and individually from teal to turquoise, where it stops being just this wonderful intellectual map, this like a skeleton, and it starts coming alive organically in our lives and in our experience. So I've been having fun chewing on that. And, I, and I'm just elated with all these these group chat groups that I'm part of now 
that, like Coda said, this is the tribe coming together. We are in second tier and we are moving from, and I see the second tier as paralleling, paralleling the first tier with six stages and they parallel on a higher octave. We're moving into the tribal, we're already moving into the second phase, the second tier. And I'm watching this come alive around me and I'm thrilled and that's kind of the big juice in my day these days. And if I had to pick one person, you know, it would be a toss up between Jung and Václav Havel, who is my personal political hero. Over and out. Uh, I agree with pretty much everything you said there, Karen. Um, I sort of feel like I actually had to like lay down before I got on the call because I felt like so ridiculously excited. Like I almost wonder if there's like heightened adrenaline in my um my heart was something like the the whole subtle body sort of kundalini stuff is seems to be getting a lot more like day to day and exciting and i was uh, brainstorming with my friend we run this fantasy store and it was all kind of like robots and like um cyberpunk which is this uh this game coming out and all this i suppose basically kind of using the subtle body in a grounded way like all this imagination and then selling stuff um i really love charles thing there was thing of like it almost it rolls off the tongue. I guess it's slightly twisted of what he said, but sort of the the bad, the bullshit, and the ugly sort of sounds like a kind of great rock band. Um, and I think the spirit of my kind of soul energy, like one of my favorite books was about this thing of describing these spontaneous images. And he was always talking about Da Vinci um, and how vivid his sort of artistic and his, imagina his imagination was to be able to just invent stuff. Um, so I think I'd kind of have to go to like the, the kind of ultimate genius of history and just, I don't know, be in his presence and poke him and something, just kind of <laughs> see how he was. So, uh, yeah. All right. So, uh, hey everybody, um, I think I would probably want to meet Gepser and have a, a sandwich with him um, somewhere in Spain. I don't know. I haven't been to Spain, so maybe Mexico. Um, and just talk with him about the state of the world. I, I would love to hear what somebody so sensitive to the state of things um, would say about where we're at. And in many ways, I feel like he was so prescient about the, the contemporary world, but um, what I would what I wouldn't do to have that conversation to have him here to kind of give feedback and 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 just sort of encounter the world and and I don't know um, I, I feel like I would probably learn a lot from that conversation so I'd probably change my mind on a daily basis but today I guess I would want to have lunch with uh, Hildegard von Bingen Great, thanks everyone. That was uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, not surprised by some of the people's chosen lunch guests. So, um, so today I thought we would dive in. The first topic we'll see. We, we may probably spend the whole time on this one. I wanted to do one on race and racism and identity and privilege. And you know, we did one before on gender, which was only intended by me, Heidi, Charles, and Paul, and we had a pretty fruitful discussion about the gender wars. And I want to do one on race, since this is a very divisive and heated topic and a large part of our social fragmentation and culture wars. <clears throat> so I thought we could, it would do us some good to shed some integral wisdom on this, on this topic. Um, may have some relevance to it, you know, Heidi come back from South Africa, which has quite the history of racial dynamics, let's put it that way. And um, I just wanted to open it up and just, I guess a few of my guiding questions are, how much should race and identity be taken into consideration in an integral community or at a teal stage of development? And I, I, I'm familiar like in, in Portland where there's a lot of green nonprofits, in my opinion, it's taken into consideration way the hell too much. And it really creates like a really, kind of a negative miasma of racial tension and conflict. Um, so, but there are other people too who want to throw away out the concept of that completely or just say this is red tribalism, so teal, let's just get rid of it. So I, I just want to open up to see what people's thoughts are, how much it should be taken into consideration, 
I'll throw on white privilege and that kind of stuff in there too. See if, if we should make a big deal out of that. And um, also about like, yeah, j just how important is identity and how much we should take into consideration. So feel free to jump in anyone if you have a thought on this. So I kind of think that, uh, I think the power dynamics of the systems that are in place can't be extracted from Teal because that's what Teal does, right? Like it just looks at the systems or that it's really focused on those systems to, to say that that part of that um, occurrence isn't part of the system is, is kind of just, it's not being honest about what you're looking at. <laughs> yeah, I certainly see racism as baked into our system in many ways that we are still only beginning to acknowledge. And it's going to be a long slog to really identify and eradicate all of them. But I'd like to bring up one of Jeremy's favorite words, diaphaneity. Um, as we get up into second tier and start to realize that everything is a construct, our societies, of course, we have constructed them, but even our perceptions and our identity is a construct. And if I've understood Jeremy's book on Gebser, <laughs> and I'm going to really, I hope to really plow into Gebser himself through the summer. But the, the, my, and my experience on my spiritual path is as we start to consciously get little glimmers of the higher states, I'm not, not the structures, but the states like the subtle and the causal, and even our own sense of self becomes diaphanous. That's, the dia uh, that's my, my take on the di Gebser's diaphaneity. And we start to see through it and see, you know, it's a play of dancing iridescent dust, and we can kind of not take it all quite so deadly seriously, and maybe see it all more clearly in, in kind of a higher light that shines through it. And then we can acknowledge the very serious problems that really exist and maybe be more, um, then take that back into our bodies and be more grounded and realistic in how we feel. Okay, what is the problem right now? What is the problem right here? What is the problem between this neighborhood and the police in my city? What is this person in front of me right now so exercised about that's making no sense to me? What's really, you know, maybe we can bring that into our daily lives. Throw that in. So I want to share an experience. We were in a little village far away from <laughs> the cities where they have no toilets, you know, only these little huts where you have to, you know. And uh, they have electricity, but white people hardly ever arrive there. And there uh, came a, a girl, maybe 10, year, 10 years old. We were all white. The group was all white people. And she had a, a baby on her shoulder and she came near me and I said something nice to the baby and the baby looked at me and, and began to, to, to cry. So what I want to say with this, racism uh, uh, comes from the otherness. Somebody looks different than you are used to and so uh, you, you have fear. And uh, when the fear persists, when you grow up, then out of that comes racism, in my opinion. And going in the, in the developmental line and even into integral, I think we really should get, off, uh, get rid of the idea of racism. We should uh, um, see people as humans and not get ever uh, intensify the as soon as we have uh, known each other, that we are humans and only a different color or a different, I don't know what, uh, we shouldn't uh, uh, emphasize on the differences. We should uh, see that uh, the com commonality. And for me, what is happening now with this racism uh, uh, thing, which comes identity, super identity, for me, it's crazy. It's going backward instead of forward. And, you know, and in South Africa, 
there was racism against uh, blacks and probably it's still, you know, and it, unfortunately it was written in law and, and that, that was the crazy thing uh, which has created a lot of um, damage. But now the racism is the other way around. So we, when we talk about racism as white people, we think here we are all biased towards black people. <laughs> but in other countries, it's different. The, the racism hits the white people, you know. So we, we, I think we really should get away from, from, from intensifying any idea of racism and get uh, into reconciliation of uh, of what has been in the past and don't construct identities in, in whatever ways on, on our external or whatever uh, <laughs> uh, how do you say looks or, 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 or on all these uh, factors which are today are, are used for to create an identity for me it is not a good way to be in the world so um i know for me i'd like some of the double standards taken out of racism like uh if you listen to a lot of green it's kind of like white people are the only racist people um and nobody else kind of shoots each other and has gang warfare and all this kind of stuff and um i think i probably agree with you heidi i think that the 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 greater identity that we all share of being human or maybe something higher is more important um and I think, I, I mean, I guess there are other stuff like kind of systematic racism and sort of unconscious stuff that, that we all have um, and that is different amongst the races, I think. There's like various ways of decoding um, race and stuff, but I, I'd kind of like to get to the point where it's kind of like, there's difference, but it's not like blown out of all proportion. Like, you know, there's black people here, there's Mexicans people, and it's like literally, well, not literally, but like polar opposites is the way it's presented rather than, I think what is probably more diverse actually than Green says, like actually appreciating that we all have different racial backgrounds and cultural and gender and all this kind of stuff and not using that to like trump the victim uh, map that Green likes, like, you know, you're a crippled kind of uh, lesbian black woman or something like cranks you way up on the victim scale or something rather than like, um, I guess almost like equalizing some of the apparent prejudice towards different races and all this kind of stuff. And personally, I'd, at times, uh, I think this is a bit of a blind spot. I'd like a little bit of like room for white people to have pride as well as guilt about our apparent uh, privilege. Um, I think that's what I mean about the equalizing. Like, I think culturally, most other races get kind of glorified for taking pride in their racial background. And um, sort of white people seem to have to constantly hold this kind of cross-like burden and apologize for history even though arguably you could argue that a lot of european culture has been uh well maybe this is a bit this is a bit taboo but in some ways kind of possibly a little bit better than you could argue that anyway i'm not necessarily saying it is but there's like a, there's a whole range of argument and sort of points that i think uh just doesn't get addressed doesn't doesn't get the light of day and stuff. And I want to add something. It is racism is not as we see it, white against black. There are blacks against blacks, and there are other. Uh, but what we would say is the same race, but they don't. So one uh, part of a population against the other, and that's because they belong to another tribe. So that's also racism. So to to we cannot even. Uh, talk about skin skin color as a basis of, of racism that's it's something different and i think it, it depends on on the old concept of we and the other and as long as we don't get <clears throat> over that uh, by development then uh, we have a problem and, and when we focus on racism we have to er eradicate racism uh, how do you do that? By learning that, that we are more or less the same as humans, you know, and not by fighting against it. I just want, before, I know, Jeremy, I know you're going to go off. Yeah. I just wanted to welcome Tim and just say, Tim, we're talking about 
race, racism, and how much should race and identity and power dynamics be taken into consideration in integral or in, in the community uh, that we're trying to build. So yeah, Jeremy, the floor is yours, my <laughs> friend. Cool, yeah, um, I kind of want to give voice to, well, this is a crossfire, so I kind of want to give voice to uh, expressing why there is so much uh, uh, consideration around race today. And I think, your, to answer your question, yes and thoroughly because i don't think a lot of people have a lot of literacy around how much race plays in, into institutional and structural violence into our culture and so on um and we're kind of at a double bind here right because what we're seeing in culture is a response to the opposite which is centuries and centuries of colonization by european powers in in the context of our cultures um that laid in and laced in a particular type of racism where whiteness equals superiority. It's been, it's, it's been colonized, let's say, even in my own background in Mexico. Um, if you are whiter, if you look more European, you appear higher class, you appear more, more noble or more dignified or more, you know, just superior. So there's an internalization of superiority of race. And you could see this in different cultures. This is not exclusive to white Europeans and Westerners. It's just that we're dealing with the fallout of colonization and colonialism for the past two, three, four hundred years. And especially in the United States where, um, you know, the message and the voices and the particular context are really amplified, like African American culture and racism and history of institutional racism in the United States, that these things are really, really loud and need to be spoken about. And I feel like now that the internet has sort of come online, we have these tools for uh, developing identities and empowering marginalized voices. And so they're running with it. You know, there's a kind of an exaggerated ex expression and intensity of fierceness. And while I do see there are certain polemics that get involved today where, you know, you could write an article on Vox and say, white people are evil and it'll be seen positively, you know. Um, even though we have polemics like that, I think we have to really understand where that's coming from rather than reacting back to it and saying, okay, this is too much. Why is it too much? Can we understand what that dynamic is and the context of it? I think in order to have an integral response. So that's that's sort of the the space I kind of want to hold for it. It's like I don't want to say like yeah, all those things are are healthy expressions of counters to racism in terms of the polemics in social culture uh, and cultural wars right now. But at the same time, I know where they're coming from. I know where that exaggerated expression is coming from. And then layering all this, and we we're just talking about this on the forums, um, the perspectival medium that we all use for our technology right is encouraging hyperbolic statements and clickbait and mass wars against one another on twitter where everybody will cobble somebody for being a racist or then all the trolls will cobble somebody who's being a progressive and we have this sort of invisible dynamic the medium that we're using is encouraging cultural fragmentation on top of all of these groups suddenly getting a voice that they haven't had before. So we have this kind of a immoderate, exaggerated expression that's like kind of, it appears to be one extreme. And then we also have this other dynamic with the social technologies we're using that are intentionally fragmenting. So we're dealing with a lot of issues here, you know, and I think as integralists, it's really important to kind of see how all of these dynamics are at play um, and, and still kind of be on the side for like, you know, raising awareness of institutional racism and so forth. But um, I, I guess the question for me is how to articulate this better rather than becoming victims ourselves, seeing the extreme polemics and this reacting and being in this ping pong where like now we're gonna push back against the left because it's been too, too polemic. Now we're gonna be too coming from the right, you know? So I wonder if there's a way through this as integralists. That's- Ah, yes, I've got to jump okay. on that. Me too. Uh, okay. Um, thanks for bringing up trolls. For the last week, I have been amusing myself by saying, okay, we're going through the same stages we went through, the structure stages, only on second tier. And if we're moving from teal to turquoise, well, back in the day when we were all in first tier, say, you know, 40,000 years ago, there were trolls. I mean, you look at the mythology that's come down to us 
from that earliest level of human culture that we have any record of, which is um, um, magenta. They were trolls. There were giants in the earth. You know, these are our unregulated affects uh, pushed by the primal, you know, primal impulses, the reptilian reflexes, with the surge of human emotion, but unregulated by any higher functions. I mean, these are the trolls. We can, and I was amusing myself. I think of trolls in Scandinavia, and equivalent monsters, yetis, and abominable snowmen, and and Sasquatch, and some of them are gentler than others, but I mean, and this is what's coming up. I mean, in our hyper-connected world, we're, we are already experiencing this. And so my response, I guess, what I would throw in, and, and what we do as integralists is do what exactly what we're already doing, and out of it, I mean, there's already a, a surge toward making our own stories among a number of people, not just myself. We need to tell better stories. We need to be the storytellers. And this is what's coming up in me right now, Jeremy. We need to be the storytellers, the lore masters, the people come around and say, hey, grandma, tell me a story around, you know, around the campfire. And you tell them a story that helps bring everybody together. We need to tell better stories. So that, that's my, my personal response to what do we do? Yeah, and I would express an invitation to give up to see everything politically but see it humanly. And I hear you, Jeremy, saying that it's um, European expansion, invasion, colonization, but the same phenomena was from the beginning of times in Egypt and wherever, you know? So it's not a new thing. And for me, it has to do with the development of, of humans. And when we can really get it out of the area of politics and see it as not left, left, right, all this shit, you know? Of, of, of controversy um, and uh, one against the other. If we could do that, then we would have a more open look on, on the things and we could find a way to navigate it. But as soon as it is connected to political views, there is no way, in my opinion. So. Um, to, your, to your question about how to um, think of this from an integral perspective, if I understood that right. There's some ways that I think that more recent, um, you know, mainstreaming concepts like impact versus intention, those are inherently quadrant based, right? Um, and then there's this, you know, like, so if we focus on racist behavior, um, that's upper left, it might be lower left. Sorry, it might upper right, it might be lower right as well if we look at institutionalized racist policies. Um, if we looked at impact, that might be an upper left, lower left aspect. It might also be lower right, as far as you can take a look at, like one of the common things that's, that people are talking about over the last month or two in particular is like, you know, relative fatality rates of, uh, of uh, African-American women relative to pregnancy or for generation or two about um, African-American men and incarceration. Um, and what was the other thing I was going to say? I suspect that there are a bunch more specific examples of that that are sort of coming in slowly. And one of them would be, um, I think probably the, the most challenging is the recognizing that there's different we spaces. And so being able to hold a great big we space and, uh, knowing that the cultural stories we're telling sometimes are based on very small disconnected chunks of the lower right. So the history, how much of the history is known? Like I, I, I did a bunch of reading for me that I hadn't done um, last year. And it, it informed me in many, many, it filled in many, many more areas of institutional racism in history and the impacts of that. Um, and that helps to me to understand the we space of like, I'm part of this system in a number of inherent ways. And that's like the questions about white privilege, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like it's all, it's all actually coming in. It's not used, they're not using integral terms, but the terms they're using have integral, um, clearly defined integral locations. Yeah, I kind of want to just echo that uh, briefly and, and 
one of the the materials that we often get uh, talk talking about about the left is sort of identity politics and but underneath that i think um regardless of how we feel this is playing out in social spaces which i don't think is healthy all the time um the literacy that is involved in kind of understanding how far institutional racism goes um yeah it, it is kind of an integral orientation because we're looking at the lower left or looking at sociological, anthropological, you know, questions of I identity formation and what a culture values and how they view other people and then how that translates into how the lived lives of certain people um, uh, get set up in terms of, you know, the institutions, in terms of education, in terms of police, you know, policing, all of those things end up kind of popping up in the lower right. So, so yeah, you're right. I think, I think the addressing these issues tends to be Kind of looking at both of those ends which is which is good um and i don't know maybe we can kind of as integral as sort of well what's healthy about green well i think that's healthy you know so can we emphasize that as integral as since these sorts of dialogues to help get over the action and reaction polarities of the left and the right you know um well kind of in, in in another way um not really affirming the polarities of the left but affirming the justice of the left you know, I've seen some integralists float around this idea that it's not just truth, beauty, and goodness, but also justice needs to be kind of angled in somewhere in, into these conversations. I want to tell you another story, which I have heard only this morning uh, by a friend of mine. And I, I, I can't remember exactly uh, where she got it from, but there was a, a tribe, an African tribe, who had a certain plant, which... Uh, was a magical plant uh, and um, Western, um, some Western people took it, made a pa patent, uh, uh, how do you say a patent? So that, patent. Yeah. Yeah, that the uh, original people had no right anymore on these plants, you know. And so one person took it on, on, on his own and, 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 and uh, the lawyer and tried to make a process and everything uh, to get the people their share of it. So for doing this, he had to, to teach this uh, tribe all sorts of things, you know, like legal stuff, and so which was completely uh, out of their um, mindset. You know, they had to learn all our Western stuff to, in order to get this money. They, at the end, um, got the money, but the tribe was finished because they, they lost their identity as, as a tribe, as humans, in, in their way of living. And one thing which I really, sorry for the noise, uh, what I really understood in, in South Africa, that there are different ways of living, of wanting to, to, to have a life. And we automatically assume that our way is the right one. And everybody should do our, our ideas of living. And that's not, not true. And we have exported the ideas of how life should be, how the world should be, how we should think, how the theories should be. And people have the right to, to do completely different things. And unfortunately, most of them uh, jump on the wagon, you know, uh, and um, adopt our, our values. And then the others then who don't feel left out. And that's then when, uh, when the inequality comes, comes on. Then they see, oh, we don't have that, what the others have. And, you know, but it's so more complex than I thought before. That's, it's amazing. And I wouldn't like to reduce it to, to what green reduces all the stuff, you know, or, or also blue. And I mean, all the, most people reduce it to two or three factors. And that's, these are the bad ones. And we have just to change that. I think there's something, I mean, I think it's fair enough to appreciate the, the role of green, but then in the sense of it being an integral conversation, I think one of the things that really needs to be said that green finds despicable is like that kind of orange and green is an advancement. Like um, all the ills of colonialism are endlessly, endlessly talked about. It's like you'd never think that there was anything uh, good that comes out of it and nobody really um, really kind of properly addresses that which is I think is a huge thing um, and also the fact that I think 
like Green is the only real culture that manages to transcend this, to be able to hold this kind of diversity. So being like kind of, I find it a bit ironic that the, the mainstream Western, um, I don't know if it matters the fact that it's kind of like white dominated, but what mainly seems to come out of Europe is the culture that um, is the most inclusive. Like I'm not saying that they don't have abominations and um, exploiting weaker countries and stuff like this, but it's kind of like, uh, Jeremy, I think I think some of the stuff in the academia of like talking about whiteness as a thing of colonialism, I think, in my opinion, it's a little bit like overstretched. I think that is just as much the case in um, other cultures like Asia and things like this. It's just like Asia isn't, you know, like China, Japan, it isn't particularly green. Um, I don't think they are as inclusive or really as concerned about, for example, in like China, Japan, immigration is very small. You know they're not worried about having having people coming in and i think this like um the double standard of the blind spots of green needs to be a time bitch slapped because i think like i'm all for being inclusive but i think at times it's uh brazenly racist or sexist against whoever is the supposed dominant um identity it's like assume that all uh all people of the of the most so-called powerful group are responsible for the the ills of others um is the kind of dark side of green and i think at times it needs to be included and i think other times frankly i think it just needs its ass kicked i think there is a there is a space for having fights and um protecting people um and i, I think some of that needs to come out into maybe that's a little bit about what charles was talking about this sort of the ugly and the and the bad sometimes needs to be met with some pretty fierce reactions rather than sort of being overly kind of nice and inclusive about it. Yeah, wow. Um, gosh, and I have to collect my, myself. So eager to jump in and now I have to collect myself. Yes, as a historian, yes, I endorse a great deal of what Paul just said. Um, Europe, Western Eastern Europe happened to be the first place on the planet that had this technological boom into, and it was economic too, you know, the basis of capitalism and the technology, and exploded orange out over all the rest of the world. But as I've uh, assimilated Ken Wilber's system, and then through him learned about spiral dynamics, you know, this is something they say in spiral dynamics, each next level of the various, um, um, colors of the various uh, structure stages is 10 times more powerful a way of dealing with the world than the one below. And Ken Wilber's had a lot to say about this too. It's not just Europe colonizing the world that suddenly oppressed everybody at every step up. And I'm speaking as a historian at every step up that new, new level as it consolidated was so much more powerful than the ones around it once it had emerged and consolidated because the transition is always rocky and we're in one of those transitions now it's rocky but once that next new level emerges and consolidates it's so much more powerful than everything else around 10 times more powerful and this has happened at all the previous stages that the other cultures who are still at that earlier level around them just kind of disintegrate under the impact. I mean, the, the ancient empires, I mean, the barbarians, Conan the Barbarian, encountering tribal peoples. I mean, at every stage this has happened, and Europe happened to be the one that led the way. And right now, Europe is leading the way into green and second tier, I think. I've been watching the European, the EU, as an experiment in transcending the sovereign nation state. You know, Orange Europe spread all over the world and imposed the sovereign nation state on everywhere else in the world, in places where it didn't, didn't fit very well and still doesn't fit very well. But now Europe, having kind of put that on the rest of the world, Europe is starting to transcend it very necessarily. So anyway, yes, Paul, um, that's a partial endorsement of what you just said. I would like to ask you, Karen, what do you mean with more powerful? What is the, the, the basis of, of considering that it is more powerful? Because I saw um, purple in, in South Africa, which they can perfectly navigate life, but in a completely different way. So I don't think that they are lower in, 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 the, in our standards, yes, 
But who said that our standards are the only ones and the right ones? So what, what more powerful, what, what does it mean, the burden? Yes, uh, nothing is higher and lower. But I think that a purple, a genuinely purple, first tier purple society would have to ha be protected. There, that there would have to be um, government social agencies at you know, whatever the orange green levels that set up parameters to make sure that they are protected and can live their wonderful purple way. And I would like to see enclaves on the planet where people can live at whatever structure stage they want to inform their communities. But what you just told the story you just told us, I think would be an example where this tribe was doing perfectly well until some company came in outside and got a patent on their, you know, thing and, and the whole encounter ended up destroying the tribe. This is what the higher um, the later developing we need we need a non judgmental level language, a non judgmental language for the structure stages because none of them is better or worse than the other. It's just the ones that are earlier to emerge are less powerful in how they deal with the world than the ones that are emerge and survive later, as your story with the patent, uh, I think, just demonstrated. Is that making any sense? Yeah, it makes sense relating to the world, but not to life. They are very powerful to live life, which we are maybe not anymore, but be like, power power over something yes that's us <laughs> which is why we don't want to protect and nourish and for those people who want to live in specific structure stages we need to help create enclaves where they can do exactly that because their ways are valuable and we don't dare just throw them out i'm gonna be a bit controversial because i can i definitely think that um especially integral it's a really like tough thing to include the low levels like you said something Heidi in your check-in I think was bang on like it goes from being like this image or symbol like oh yeah red whatever like rather than something really deep and uh, embedded in your life but there's part of me where I kind of do see each stage as superior to the other ones like not absolutely and there's ways that you lose um, you lose things that are really important like you know losing the the familial bonds and the deep tribal community and all this kind of stuff but then again, it's like, you know, what about the violence and being sort of um, subject to the village elder just because they happen to be the oldest person where we have all these weird superstitions and it's like, you know, some weird God is going to, we're going to have to sacrifice um, a six-year-old in some brutal um, ceremony and all this kind of stuff. And the fact that most tribes can't get on with each other at all. Um, I mean, even native Indians, you know, like scalping and there was like loads of infighting between them. Um, I think it's a really, uh, it's a really difficult thing to sort of like appreciate all the different levels and sort of not have a superiority uh, complex about it. But at the same time, I kind of do feel like each stage is kind of superior to the ones before. Um, nobody really gives a damn about race until kind of late orange and green. Um, you know, so, and, and you know, on, it almost was on almost probably you could map out on all the quadrants is probably better at each stage than before. I kind of want to give voice uh, to you. Uh, well, well, sorry, one second, Jeremy. I just want to say, so um, the so there, there kind of is another discussion kind of erupted here about hierarchy and stages being superior to the other one. Uh, I'm wondering, do we want to focus on this one or should we go back to race or should we do a focus group and break out into breakout groups? What, do, what, do people, what are people thinking? Because there, there are two tracks of conversation happening here. Yeah, good point, Ryan. Um, I want to add an international comment here. I live in Canada, and uh, I think there's some striking differences between how Canada right now is dealing with uh, the problem of racism and, and uh, how it's being dealt with in the United States. Uh, for the last several years, there's been a lot of publicity around the number of indigenous women that have disappeared, have been murdered in uh, in the uh, tribal areas, um, more northern, more isolated regions of Canada. Uh, what's striking about this uh, to me is that the conversation is national. It's open. Uh, the political parties are talking about it. There's been a major report submitted to the government, uh, actually sponsored by the government, if I'm not mistaken, that uses the word genocide to refer to the way the native peoples have been treated 
uh, in Canada, and uh, from the Prime Minister on down, right through the ranks of the Liberal Party, uh, the NDP, uh, not so much the, the Conservatives, they'd probably rather not talk about it. Uh, money is being put into the problem of poverty, drugs, and um, disintegrating infrastructure, including schools, hospitals, the whole works, on native reserves. Uh, and as I said, what strikes me about this is that it is a real national conversation. Every newspaper is talking about it. Uh, television reporters are talking about it. Uh, there's debates about whether genocide is an appropriate uh, term to use for what's happened uh, to uh, the natives in Canada's uh, history, and is this still going on? And uh, I'm not sure that kind of conversation is taking place in the United States. My premise, of course, is that if uh, a discussion like this becomes national, then there's going to be movement on it. Then uh, more people are going to be alerted, educated, they're going to pay attention and uh, governments are going to be forced by uh, people at uh, higher levels of development to do more and more about it, and, uh, and I think that's going to happen. So um, in the United States, do you think that kind of open, honest, national conversation is taking place at all with respect to uh, racism uh, against blacks and Latinos? And what about the indigenous uh, native populations as well? Is that conversation going on? And do you agree with me that it's needed? I agree that it's needed. I'd say, yes, it's definitely going on, but our media and intercommunication is tribalized uh, in the circles, and they are very many that care about these things. That conversation is very, very much going on. Yeah, it's definitely happening here. I don't know if it's happening to the degree that we'd like it to be happening, but it's starting to it, in a way that I haven't seen when I was younger. And I'm sure most of us haven't seen this much attention um, uh, addressed to these issues. Now, whether or not that translates to like lower left or upper left or more policy decisions and questions, I don't know. I mean, if we look at Standing Rock, that wasn't exactly a success, you know, I, so in terms of actual policy changes, I think um, what the you know, indigenous rights and, and these race questions are playing into, they're also playing into class questions. They're playing into systemic issues with our society and the institutional forms of violence that we play and have played. And it's not exclusive to the West, but in the context of where we are right now, there's a, a very an evolving awareness that's become very sensitized to it, but through that has become very sensitized to um, the big picture and how the whole thing needs to transform. I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, to solve uh, race problems or to, to really help the indigenous people, uh, to really help the environment, we need to rethink economics, ideology, et cetera. I mean, that people are talking about regenerative post-capitalist societies are really the only, the whole system has to transform in order to address these aspects of these pieces of it that aren't fragmented. Um, I just hope that conversation can intensify and, and translate into healthy transformation. So, um, but I don't know. I don't know if we wanted to do split off groups or I feel this relates back to race, though. We we're talking about the spiral. We're talking about development. And if we were in an academic setting right now, there is no way we could say that the West is higher. You know, even if we're trying to be neutral intellectuals talking about a model of consciousness, it wouldn't run. It would not get off the ground. It would be immediately picked at um, and deconstructed. So. I think this does play into this question of race. It's inescapable. It's not something divergent. It's intersecting. Um, I'm going to pause here before I dump, jump into my own thoughts. But I see that Tim wants to, to say something. But before, I, I would like to say that we are mainly looking from the right quadrants. I'm always in these discussions, I miss the left-hand quadrants. Because society, yes, has to change. But who is society? Society are we. And before the single people don't change their mind, um, that nothing will happen. And to impose on them something that they have to think differently, that doesn't work. So for me, the only thing as we talk about racism is really to get into contact with different people. And, uh, you know, and 
learn that they are humans and no difference in, in the sense of, yeah, cultural difference and everything, but that's uh, after the, the Second World War, Germany and France had uh, done a program to exchange young people. So they get to know each other. And this has created a huge, huge, huge difference. And in, in, that was the beginning of the youth uh, going around in the world and to, to, to see other, other cultures, to get to, learn, to know other people. That's for me what needs to be done. And not theoretical, the system has to change some other legislation. This doesn't really... That is the second thing. We, we are, have the tendency to do the second before the first and that's uh, for me not not uh, how do you say sustainable it, it, it won't work so I well don't Heidi there's like, no there's no racist in this room is there we'll have uh, Tim Tim was gonna uh, jump in here uh, I say, right I was just responding to you directly Charles I'm racist I would guess that most of us are well, uh, Tim, uh, can you uh, say more about that? Like, what, what, is, what does racist mean to you? <laughs> so race is, the way I understand it, it is the uh, race has built the culture that was around for, oh, I don't know, three, 400 years before I was. It's the air that I breathe. It's the water that I swim in. How could I not be wet? Well, so you see it in yourself. Yes, absolutely. Can I, can I ask you a, a down-to-earth question? Uh, I, uh, you, you, may, you may own your house. Now, suppose a lot of black people started to move into your neighborhood. Would you start to freak out about your property values and pack up your kids, your wife, and head out to some lily white suburb? I'm betting you wouldn't. So let me define racism for you the way I understand it. Racism is in part about treating other people as not, the way I understand it, is in part about treating other people as though their race, if it was different from mine or different from another person's, somehow implied a difference in their capacity, in their behavior, in their motivations, something that wasn't universally human. So, Racism is something that is a set of sort of cultural norms or expectations that I think personally everyone who's raised in a racist society imbibes. And that's where that metaphor of like, it's the water we're all swimming in. How could we not be wet? And I'll pause there. Well, yes, I absolutely wouldn't move out based on those people. Um, you, what was your example? African-American folks? coming in if they, if they weren't around me and then suddenly there were a bunch of them around me or something. No, that wouldn't cause me to move. Um, and I recognize that when you say African-American folks, I created a number of images and stories about them that I wouldn't necessarily create about white people. And a little bit of that you could say is like, well, you know, you're making stereotypes based on your experience. That's sort of maybe somehow broadly accurate or something. I, like it has a mod uh, not broadly accurate, but it has a little bit of true of true experience behind it. Um, and I'm actually I'm going to stop warbling because I think other people may be more articulate about this than I am. But I I truly believe at this point my default concept is that everybody in the U.S. and certainly probably North America and probably other areas are racist. Everywhere in the world, everybody is racist. Yes, but to what degree, people? <laughs> right. <laughs> like you, you guys can talk about the traces of racism in yourself, and I totally agree. I would find them in myself as well. But they're not little hidden subjects in your subconscious as if they're repressed. My guess is that every one of us could probably talk uh, personally about the, uh, um, uh, the unwelcome images that come to mind when we think about other races. Uh, but those... Uh, I'm guessing are more conscious to us than they are uh, to the uh, uh, neo-Nazi crowds that are uh, causing so much worry and concern uh, in the United States. So, uh, yeah, okay, uh, I'm capable of being uh, a serial killer. I'm capable of being 
um, a sex trafficker. I acknowledge all these potentialities. And because I was raised in, in, in a racist culture, I can readily admit that uh, I probably have some uh, repressed elements in my subconscious. But uh, again, the question is, to what degree, right? Does my, does my racism affect how I treat other people? And I'm betting everybody in this room can say, well, probably not very much. So um, would you agree, uh, Tim, that there are degrees of racism and that just to say, oh, well, we're, we're all racist as the water we, we swim in, is to burden oneself with an unnecessary quantity of guilt. It's not helpful. No, I would not agree with that. Um, I think it is useful, and here's why. Um, I think in the same way that I was talking about impact uh, and uh, intention being uh, improvements in the way that we talk about uh, oppressive structures and behaviors, I think actually identity of being a racist is not valuable and it's often used for people who aren't used to being uncomfortable. Talking about race is often used as a distraction so that they don't have to talk about the relative impacts of racism and the disproportionate impacts of racism on different people. And so I'm very interested in hearing people talk about what behavior is racist. And then within that, and once we get into the impact discussion, I think then it is really useful to talk about magnitude, as you said, but I think it's a complete waste of energy if we get hung up on who's a racist or who's not a racist. I think it's really useful if in particular, the people who are in positions of authority would take on this thing that I'm trying on, this idea of like water is wet and I'm in the water. I'm a man, I'm sexist. Do I think that women are a bigger force in creating uh, uh, sexual oppression than men? Yes, because they're the primary parents. I think they tend to instill more gender socialization than men do because of their role as primary caregiver in early years. And so I can hold both of those just fine. I don't have to judge either of us. What is it we're looking toward? What is it that we want? That's about impact. It's about behavior. It's about internal understanding. It's all the different quadrants. And the other thing I wanted to say, and I think it kind of ties together our earlier detour away from racism into stages, they're color-based, is that I'm still working on this. Um, just this month, I've started doing a, an integral training, um, a very basic one. Um, but my goal is to try to understand spiral dynamics. And the more that I hear about it, I found myself really frustrated. I listened to one, anyway, uh, the more, the impression that I have is that, um, we will name a culture as if it's a, as if all across it, it's a single color. And that's what I heard Heidi talking about. Like, because a culture is materialistically orange or whatever, so, you know, it has access to certain amounts of abundance with food or something like that. We'll like assume that it's orange in all these other ways. And what I'm feeling is that there's tons and tons of cultures, which um, in various aspects, they're in very different stages. And many, if it's orange, we're not being specific when we're talking about it. Is it a repressed orange? Is there an orange that has tremendous amounts that aren't included from previous cultures? Because if, for example, that, that tribe from Heidi's uh, discussion, if that tribe or that nation, when it interacted with a judicial process, if it then, if that judicial process was mutually exclusive with some very valuable cultural heritage that they had, and that was lost, that means that that judiciary had repressed or not excluded something, not included something. So I'm really starting to question using these language of colors, unless we're being much more specific. What part is orange? Is it healthy orange? Is it unhealthy orange? Barring that, I'm really struggling to find how valuable this language is. Amen. Um, yeah, uh, so I just want to bring Coda in because Coda wrote something on the chat uh, wondering and uh, haven't gotten a chance to say much. So, Dakota, if you want to uh, elaborate a little bit more, I want to give you the opportunity. I got to go, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Charles. I was just, I was just uh, from what Charles said, it was, um, he was saying that, like, trying to bring this awareness of what, you know, the idea of a oh, wet. 
um, you know, isn't that like overwhelming with, doesn't that create an overwhelming sense of guilt? And I was just trying to point out that like, for me, being aware of something doesn't mean you feel guilty about it. <laughs> it doesn't automatically mean that you have that emotion. Um, there's that step you know, you can have that non-judgmental um, space in between an observation and your emotional reaction to it. Yeah, that's... Um... I think Heidi, did you, did you want a little Heidi and Paul and Jeremy? Yeah, I wanted still to come up with what the, the, the concept of racism. We always think it is, you know, colors probably of the skin. But for instance, in the Bavarian um, village, there are two uh, different groups, let's say two, two um, um, how do you call these associations for something? Maybe one for, for soccer and the other for um, preserving nature or whatever. And they fight in the same way as we would say uh, races, uh, race, racists fight against the other race, you know, and who is more powerful and uh, the, the right to, but you know, they are the same, the same culture, they have the same skin color, they have everything, but they behave like we attribute to racism. So what, what is racism? I, I really don't get that. Well, how do you define racism? I, you know, what, what is race? Uh, all together, you, you did you did a definition, yeah. But I don't know. I I'm not happy with that. I think. Um, oh, sorry. Let me let everybody else go. I'll go. Paul, I think was next. Paul and Jeremy. Yeah, I, I see a point. I see a point, Heidi. I think this is why my my general one, which is a lot more nuanced, it's sort of like it's hard to draw lines between. Like, you, you get, if you go to Africa, there are various types of people. Um, like 100 meter sprinters always hear of like West Africa and then you go to the other places and they're always like the really amazing endurance and all this kind of stuff. Um, I guess for me, tribalism, the, that kind of, um, that kind of like all encompassingly grabs a lot of it. Like I have my tribe, I have my identity and I hate whoever is outside of it. And um, I guess I was thinking a little bit, Heidi, when you were talking about the focus on the left quadrants, because I remember, I think it might've been Salzman or somebody said this where it's like orange can and, and maybe coda you were drawing on this a little bit where i it was like orange can pick up on maybe like factual like okay this institution needs to change this is uh legally um unethical but not the more like sticky interior cultural kind of baggage like the interior work that it takes like maybe that was what kind of tim was talking about like this unconscious racism or um cultural unconscious kind of ways that the um uh, tribes relate is kind of a stickier more um tricky tricky way to navigate um and i think that that takes a lot of work and then also i don't know the part of me the way the discussion sort of felt to me was like the energy i don't know like too much kind of again this like non-equalizing thing like almost like back into like white shame or like if you say that racism is the I've heard Greens kind of say this a lot, the air you breathe, it's like, how do you make any distinction then? It's kind of like, well, what about, I think degrees of racism do matter. Um, I think if you have some, some minor uh, racist unconscious, like I'm talking to a black guy and I see a bunch of images of like, I don't know, rappers or criminals and all this kind of stuff, but that's like a brief flash. Um, basically, I just treat him like anybody else once we're once we're talking to me it's not a major um issue um and there's something about i don't know there's something about the the tribal vibe where it just seems to just blow up to just be like all encompassing so suddenly like racism is everywhere or sort of like uh this race is you know demonic and this other race is kind of uh, the super oppressed and all this kind of stuff where it needs to be a lot more um I just feel like everybody needs to come to the to the table and admit that everybody does actually have something to say. Like in in specific examples, there are degrees where some like um, like Native Indians, for example, like struggling with 
tobacco addiction and stuff, they obviously have it very worse in this specific scenario. And so not to equalize it absolutely, but I do think generally, I think there is a kind of way that I think we, everybody can have grievances and they all need to be held without having this. I don't think it's a minor bias with some races. I think it's a major one. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's my take. Yeah. I, um, I think when we're talking about race is the, is the air that we breathe or the sea and we swim or that we're all wet because we're all in the water. I, I don't, and I acknowledge that again, that the, the, the social technologies are engendering themselves towards these extreme polemics where it is better to say that white Eurocentrism or, or, or white European culture is evil and make a, uh, uh, an article like that and make that kind of polemics and energize an opposition of the oppressed and the oppressor and that kind of style of thinking oppositional thinking is so endemic actually to perspectivalism that Gebser talks about and the mental structure so I think being aware of the the structures of consciousness that are that Gebser articulates that are at play right now in culture is really important because the whole way it's being framed whether we are pushing back against it or going for it is being framed in this way so that that's that can be a problem because it doesn't give you an out you know you've just got this situation of one extreme and the other the the oppressor and the oppressed and so on funny enough i think jordan peterson is often describing something that is so you know he, he's describing a style of culture that is present and i think he's playing into it himself but um for me, though, the idea that it's the air that we swim is not so much saying that, okay, everybody who's white is basically Hitler. It's not saying that. It's not saying there's no degree. It's saying there's an environment, an atmosphere. And this is the style of thinking that comes online with, quote unquote, green. You start to kind of feel generalities again. And I, I know green is about deconstruction, but I don't think that's true. I think it's about sensing into um, our our nervous system again and feeling into holes again and kind of getting this general vibe that okay there's this institutional um dynamic at play where there's this power centered centered here and then we're kind of at the outliers of that so there's an awareness of power, power dynamics there's an awareness of atmospheres it's the same language that actually is used in climate change discussion where like yeah, all every every one of us when we drive our cars and turn our our engines and buy things from Amazon are partaking in this climate crisis right now. We're all part of it. It doesn't mean that you need to beat yourself on the back and, and be like, oh, whoa, like we are terrible. Every time I drive my car to work, I am destroying Gaia. Like we don't want to have that sort of attitude towards ourselves. Tim Morton talks about this all the time. To be aware, what Coda was saying, without guilt is like really important. So if we can distinguish that and acknowledge the whole picture, the, acknowledge the air that we breathe and the sea we swim in, while not, while also being critical of the, the, the statements that everyone is Hitler who's white or something like that. Like, we have to be able to hold both. You know, I think this is the complex thinking that we really need. Um, and I still didn't get to my discussion about the structures, but I'll just say 15 seconds of that. Um, I have the same problems, Tim, that you're saying about spiral dynamics. And this is why I distanced myself from actually using that or incorporating that into my writing and research. Um, because of the sort of proclivity that we have for generally assuming that an entire culture is at a level of development. I mean, this is the same problem that um, antiquated thinking in, in the West that framed other cultures that way had. So we we have to think about spiral dynamics differently than that if we're even going to use it as a model or we're just going to end up kind of recapitulating the same early 20th century problems about um, dominator hierarchies and think that we're somehow aware of it when we're just reinventing the wheel. So um, Gepser has alternatives to that and I'll save that for another conversation. We can, we can also um, continue the discussion on uh, Discord, and Discord will live up to its name. <laughs> um, so I think, Karen, if you want to just go really quickly and then we'll do a close out. I'll just pick one direction of three that I could go in right now, based on all you wonderful people. Um, when I was born in 1952, I think there were still lynchings in South 
the southern United States. The Jim Crow laws were definitely there. They had been there since the Restoration. And during my childhood, I watched the March on Selma. I watched Martin Luther King. I watched him get shot. Um, I was in high school when the Black Power Movement came up and CODA. Uh, when I was a senior in high school and I was hanging out with the liberal kids, you know, I grew up Unitarian, very green. And one of the kids in my clique in high school would wear this button that said, I am white, I am not proud. And I remember even back then at the ripe age of 16 or 17 thinking, there's something wrong with this. You know, everybody gets to be proud of who we are. I'm proud, I'm white, I'm proud. He's black, he's proud. She's Chicana. She's proud. They, we didn't even have the term Chicana yet. So even back then, I was kind of going, wait a minute. And jumping back to a much earlier point, um, I think one of Jeremy's earlier riffs, um, I watched the black, I, I watched the whole civil rights movement happen. I, my formative years were during the civil rights movement. How far we have come, even in my lifetime. And now I see we are going through another transformational era. And that's one of my big riffs for another period, but um, we were tra going through the transformation from modern to postmodern. Now we're going through another transformation. It's happening in my lifetime. We have two major changes of era in one human lifetime now that's never happened before. I'm watching the next and all these issues are coming, churning up to the surface again. And we're seeing just how much farther we have to go. But when I see how far we've come, just in my lifetime. And then as a historian, I look what we've come from 150 years ago, a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago, I say, um, yes, there is a spiral and it progresses up into better ways. We can revisit tribalism and bring back its vitality and wonderful sides without the hor horrible savageries. We can do this. So that's my ringing summation here. Yeah, thank you, Karen. And boy, was I a fool to think that we may be getting through this in like half an hour or something. Um, and uh, I'm also really sad that we have to end this discussion because I have to come clean. This was my favorite one because I love talking about controversial things. And I felt this one had probably the most heated uh, quality to it. And that's what I wanted as I said at the beginning. So thank you so much. And I was trying hard not to go into some kind of a higher bliss state uh, during the conversation. So thanks for very, I didn't say much. Uh, so thank you. And I really look forward to continuing the discussion. There's a, I'll just tell you my challenge before we end, before we do a close out, whereas um, I wasn't sure how actively to moderate this because everyone was so eager to jump in and everyone was contributing something so engaging and, and passionate from different perspectives. So I wanted to end uh, by doing, by introducing a little mediation technique and have everyone go around and answer from this angle. And it did seem like there were some different camps of thought, you know, that people had a different emphasis that they were getting at. And I'm wondering if everyone felt like their position or what they really wanted to get across was adequately understood. And if you feel like you're, what you're trying to emphasize wasn't fully understood or you just want to mention it once again, I want the closing to be, what do you want other people to understand about your stance on race that you feel like they don't understand quite yet? So I'll repeat that one more time. What do you want the other camps or people to understand about what you're trying to bring to this conversation that you feel like may not be quite understood? So I'll leave it at that and someone take it away. Let me know if you need clarification. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> um, I feel like we, we got to important areas here. Um, what I feel like is the deeper discussion is this question that Heidi brought up you were mentioning about exploring different cultures and, and, and going through this trip and really kind of feeling this, the difference rather than the higher or lowerness. Um, I really feel like we need to explore that further. And, and that's sort of what Gepser is bringing into this, this tension in the spiral dynamics framing um, that I don't necessarily feel like you guys don't know that's my position, that my tension is with it, but I feel like the need to enter a dialogic with everybody, not a dialectic, but like Edgar Morin says, a dialogic, we're all kind of relating and, and opening this up. I feel like that would be important. So I just anticipate those future conversations. Yeah, that gives me um, the next. I want to say that the people who are um, focusing on spider dynamics in South Africa, 
they have a completely different understanding of spiral dynamics what we have normally. So that was really eye-opening. And <clears throat> what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I see often in these groups, oops, <clears throat> oh, okay, uh, is um, the, the proclivity to focus on the right-hand quadrants and not on the left-hand quadrants. I always try to bring you back in saying what is, what the, the inner development which the individuals have to do. And I see often that it's not really acknowledged or not really seen the importance of that. So I might seem to be a, an advocate for that and probably I am, but I do it mainly because it's a missing. And for me, it's the most important part. Our individual way of being in the world, which then the other quadrants come come along. And I think there is where the transformation needs to be. To And we are sort of the beginners, probably. We should be the beginners, the starting point of this transformation, instead of calling for society to do something, you know. And as I said, race for me it it begins. I, I don't I don't really understand it. You know, it 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 seemed to be before in my understanding that it is um, still skin color, and I hear a little bit as if it is still in in your uh, opinion. And but for me, it doesn't make sense anymore. So something else, <laughs> and I would like to explore that a little bit better. Yes. <laughs> yes, I totally agree with what Heidi said. It, I mean, we can go pronounce all sorts of things, but we have to be it ourselves or else it's just hot air. I did not feel, I, I mean, I feel no need to express myself further or feel understood further. I, this is a very satisfying conversation and it's just opening a lot further. But I have, they, we all have all sorts of means through which to express ourselves. And I just, I'm just very grateful to have this group to play with. Thank you all very much. Tim, Paul, Coda. I guess I could say a little bit about what Heidi is saying with um, the balance between the interior and the exterior. I totally agree with um, needing to pay attention to the interior, but I think that it's also important to remember the interaction between the two. Um, maybe it's just because I find um, behaviorism so useful as like a concept of understanding why I do the, my behaviors and changing them to be more in line with what I'd like them to be. Um, but I, I and that happens, you know, with our systems. That's, you know, on the we bottom half of the quadrants, um, the systems inform the culture, and there's this interplay between them. And I think it's important you can't just split them apart. They they're together, and you can't like it's great to look at them from those different perspectives, but they're not, you know, you can't separate them from each other. Um, I think my stance is generally that I, I think the crux of it is I'm pro-tribalism, sort of pro-good tribalism. Like I think what, one of the things I want is to be able to like people of various different races to be able to rip each other and kind of take pride in their own culture and that not descend into violence and craziness and um, something about integral being able to hold that degree of like nuance and distinction. And um, to know personally, in this debate, I think I had this, I had this real flavor just to want to like make an actual stand to make like, like this is really what I think it is and be less like, oh man, no, I see a point and kind of being inclusive, even though I think everybody uh, said stuff that I, I can really agree with. And uh, I'm a bit of right, <laughs> it did feel kind of uh, more fiery and a bit triggery at times, um, which I guess is kind of a really, the kind of embodied thing we wanted really that's kind of that is where it gets like challenging and i think uh i think race and 
tribalism and cultural stuff is pretty is kind of a hot topic so it's kind of nice to uh lean into that a little bit um have a little bit more of a don't know intense uh crossfire um first of all i wanted to just say i'm sorry for the video going on and off in my life right now things have ramped up and i'm often eating or feeling like i need to make use of these calls in multiple ways so so as not to be super distracting, I'm just turning the video off. And I apologize if that detracts a little bit, but I, I try to sit down and turn it on when I can. Um, I definitely got a little triggered. Uh, I really, I'm so grateful to have, have a chance to have this discussion with a variety of, of perspectives. Um, and I think uh, Ryan, to, to your like framing question, I think what I would say is um, I feel fairly, I don't know if I was understood because there wasn't a lot of feedback, but I'm guessing that um, a number of the points that I, that I made, uh, you know, were related to. Um, and if I were to try to sum up, it's my sense of wanting greater nuance and that even in racism, just as the same way I was complaining about spiral dynamics being oversimplified and overgeneralized. Um, I, I feel like, yeah, I want that same level of awareness and specificity to be applied just within the racist uh, unpacking of the racism concept, what we started to do. And I would be delighted if, if this were a topic again um, on a Thursday that I was gonna be in, in range. Uh, I think that was everyone. Thank you everyone so much. I have a couple of uh, announcements at the end here. So I forgot to mention also one of my intentions was of having more controversial issues was again to surface one on one debates. And I kind of wanted to reintroduce that and so we can go deeper with two people and we only did one of those and it was hard to find uh, points of contention that people had a hard disagreement on that they could go in for like half an hour. So uh, please, I don't really know if I, people have suggestions on how to like summon people to try to organize that if that's what we want. I really want to get that on the calendar and reintroduce that format just to kind of change things up and keep it energized and flowing in a, you know, fun direction. So maybe Discord or something, we can try to arrange that. Um, the other thing was uh, the spiral dynamics debate thing too. I think that that also sounds like we need to do another look at that and uh, maybe one of these topics again if people want to do a one-on-one -on -one, Paul sounded pretty uh, Passionate about that. Maybe like so. Yeah, I'm not gonna call it names here, but hopefully this will we can organize that somehow and the last thing is uh, uh, Heidi, maybe you can talk about this. I'm gonna talk to Heidi tomorrow about your South Africa tour Did we want to invite other people to ask questions or why don't you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I, I today already had a chance to sort of get out something of my experience. And I asked Ryan if he wanted to do an interview with me because I find it difficult to just write something. But uh, um, when, when, when the discussions can come on, it, it is formulating better in my mind. So we will do it tomorrow at, when was it, 11 a.m.? 11 a.m. Pacific, Pacific time. time. And we do it on my channel, I think. And if you are invited to come and ask me questions, I, you really help me to, to uh, integrate this, this experience, to understand what it was, you know, that, that would be very helpful to me. So invitation tomorrow. I, I can send it if, 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 if how, how shall we do that? You, uh, you must send an email with the link. Yeah, uh, but not, maybe not to everybody, maybe m more to our group here. We had, the talk today already. Um, so I will figure that out who was there and then I sent you the link again. Okay. That would be great. Okay. I was just wondering, um, I'm looking at the Discord. Uh, oh. was, when was Campfire? Yeah, that's tomorrow. But afterwards, uh, I wondered, uh, I have heard about a Discord and I've heard about Facebook groups. I never got yeah. any any information about that. So I don't know what what you have done in the meantime. So maybe you sent me an invitation or something. That Checking would... out, gotta go. Okay. okay. Yeah, sorry, Heidi. <laughs> I, I might have made the same mistake with the list. So I'll send you, um, we, we haven't really used the Facebook or WhatsApp anymore. So mm. the Discord is kind of where the place to be. So I'll, I'll get you hooked up with that. Okay. 
Uh, great. Oh, Jeremy, did you want to? Oh, um, I don't know. I'm just being a little greedy, but if anybody wants to continue um, an audio chat afterwards at Discord, that would be cool. We have little audio rooms, and uh, we could kind of just hang out and chat casually about this or deconstruct or de uh, decompress. <laughs> I'm down. Cool. <laughs> okay. Bye -bye. Uh, thank you, guys. Yeah, Jeremy, is that what's called a uh, voice channel? Is that the same thing? Yep. Yeah, those are the voice channels. Yep. Just click the channel when you sort of pop in there. And um, I'm going to try and uh, get to your thing, Heidi. Sounds great. I want to squeeze in campfire and, um, and your call. Okay. Awesome. See you soon. Take Bye, care. everybody.